This is Akashwani Bengaluru. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Yuvavani. On the 23rd day of this month, August 2024, we are all set to observe the first National Space Day to commemorate the first year anniversary of the stupendous achievement by Indian scientists and engineers, Chandrayaan 3's successful landing on the moon. Let me take you back to those final moments before the landing last year. A nation of 142 crores glued to TV and radio sets, witnessing history being made. The countdown, the palpitations, the pictures of anxious scientists at ISRO across the news channels with an inset image of our beaming Prime Minister. And cheers! India. Our India. A developing country. A country that achieved independence from an oppressive regime only 76 years ago. Became the first ever to soft land on the south pole of the moon. The bud, born in the hearts of our children and youth, with Mangalyan, now bloomed in all its glory. It coloured their dreams. It enveloped their imaginations. It ushered them into the new incredible era of the first-rate space technology and science in their very own country. To celebrate this spectacular triumph and to understand the past and future of India's space journey, Tonight in Yuvavani, we have a group of young research scholars from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. In 1984, an iconic conversation between two Indians encapsulated the entire nation. Then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi asked Quadrant Leader Rakesh Sharma, what does India look like from space? To which Rakesh Sharma, barely able to stifle his grin, replied with the legendary words, Sare Jahan Se Acha. In that moment, the entire, entire world was in front of him. And what an unbelievable moment. The Chandrayaan mission is a classic underdog story of how India reached space. And fast forward to today, we are riding the crest of a new wave of aerospace innovation and exploration. Chandrayaan 3 marks another historic milestone in our quest to unravel the mysteries of the cosmos, showcasing India's prowess on the global stage. I'm Neeraj Ramprasad, and I'm joined by Niharika Naveen, Samai Patel, and Vidit Goswami. A quick introduction of us. We are a group of young engineers uh, conducting research at the Department of Aerospace Engineering, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, under the guidance of Professor Dr. S. N. Omkar. We are here today to explore the recent advancements and the achievements in the aerospace sector. Talk a little bit about the initiatives the government has taken up to support this sector. And most importantly, talk about the impact this the entire aerospace sector has had on the nation and the youth of this country. So I think it's only fair to start this discussion with Chandrayaan-3 mission. What are your thoughts on the recent success of Chandrayaan-3 mission? I think that's a great question to start us off. I personally think from a technical angle, Chandrayaan-3 is fascinating for a lot of reasons. I know that the Pragyan rover is still operational. It's hurtling across the surface. It discovered sulfur about 10 days after it landed. And that is incredible because sulfur could either mean that there's a reserve of ice nearby or it could also indicate volcanic activity. Both are incredible because it kind of connects to our own world. And it also has very advanced technology to be able to handle the temperatures of the lunar surface or even do chemical analysis of what rocks are present on the surface. Each of these points are so incredibly inspiring to our nation, and particularly the youth, because we've been encouraged to follow the progress of this mission so closely. Not only that, but when it was launched last year, it kickstarted an unofficial space race. 
While companies or space agencies like JAXA and Roscosmos had plans to launch lunar missions, they launched SLIM and Lunar 25 pretty consequently. Despite that, India was still the first to make it to the south pole of the moon and the fourth country to have a soft landing. And while this was more an unofficial space race, I think the original space race back in the Cold War brought pioneering launches that went across the solar system. And while the space shuttle, which was a part of this race, is long discontinued, India has seen some great developments through a very similar vehicle. Pushpak, it's been dubbed the Swadeshi Space Shuttle, it has had it has had three successful test landings, which is a great milestone in entering the whole reusable rocket segment. It also has an indigenously developed navigational system, which is called NAVIC. Right, right. I'm glad you mentioned about this NAVIC technology, because this is an incredible step by India in the direction of self-reliance. And it started all the way back in 2013. And since then, it has reduced our dependence on other nations for our navigation requirements which is really crucial if you think about it, because we mostly depend on GPS and GLONASS services, which is predominantly used across the world. And this GPS technology is developed and maintained by US defense, while the GLONASS is developed and maintained by the Russian defense. And very difficult to say, you know, when the civilian services may be discontinued or degraded. So in terms of self-reliance, this is an incredible step towards it. And also there are several other government initiatives that has had significant impact in a similar way. But I would like to talk a little bit about the budget, because that's the most uh, recent happening. The budget allocated was $120 million for the space tech startups. This is an incredible initiative towards handholding and supporting the new startup initiatives in the aerospace sector. It really pushes them to raise their next round of funding. And also this is a step towards privatization. What are your thoughts on it, Samar? Yeah, I mean, you're very right when you talk about self-reliance and privatization. We have uh, certain examples like SpaceX and we have Blue Origin, which has been Lockheed Martin. I mean, those are the players in US that have been helping public sector get that thing off. And privatization actually helps in meeting growing demands. It also helps in fostering more opportunity. It also like for the youth, for startups, as you said, like, you know, there's been more, more funding and more initiatives to support startups. And this is actually reflecting also in the new Indian space policy of 2023, which is heavily focused on privatization and supporting privatization. So we all know ISRO, right? So ISRO has been given two arms, basically one known as in space which is basically an agency that is established with its own group of people that will permit and oversee the activities of private company. So it'll be like an interface between ISRO and non-government entities. Its major work would be to encourage, promote and handhold the private sector for their participation in space sector so that, you know, private sector companies in private sector can actually participate in end-to-end activities, starting from building satellites to launch vehicles and then collect the data and disseminate and all those things. So it's a very great initiative. It's also capable of uh, making sure that private agencies are getting all the support they need from the government. So why do we need this? So, you know, there has been examples like the Kaveri engine, which was the engine that was supposed to power the first light combat aircraft. And because of like technical and budget constraints, it was delayed for a very long, long time. And also like India's dependence on, for example, Russian equipment, such as the S-400 missile uh, defense systems, right? So there is a huge need for self-reliance and improvement and more capital. And I think privatization will actually help it and the policy does reflect it. When it comes to the second arm, which is the commercial arm, which is also a very significant move by the Indian policy. So uh, they set up a new space India Limited, which is basically a company under Department of Space and it'll act as a commercial arm of ISRO. It will basically facilitate uh, the commercialization of space activities. For example, recently, there was a dedicated commercial mission, the PSLV C-53, which was the first official like public-private collaboration for a space launcher in India. So basically, the three satellites from Singapore were launched as a part of a commercial contract signed by ISRO, along with which a secondary payload of a private company in India, private Indian space startup, was also attached. So that's a big step when it comes to commercializing. So I think we have much more to see after even Chandrayaan 3 with this commercialization and privatization. 
when you talk about budget right uh, so you mentioned that there has been increase in funding for startups not only from the government side but they have also improved the foreign investment rules so they have introduced like foreign direct investment which basically states that any non government entity any outside entity that is not indian or even indian entities they can invest through automatic route in manufacturing of components and system for up to 100% automatic route basically means they don't have to take the government route they don't have to take permission from rbi and that goes for 49% for launch vehicles and 74% for satellite manufacturing this will bring in a lot of investment and will be really good for development that is i think the impact of the new policy as well as the budget on yeah i, I strongly agree with this initiative that is facilitating this foreign investment to have a significant impact right because uh, if you see the indian ecosystem has been dependent on foreign investment for the longest time and it's pivotal for the indian startups to actually leverage this kind of you know initiative this kind of support to get this foreign investments to attract foreign investments and to showcase on a global stage government support like we just spoke about is going to be crucial and we can see that in skyroot which is one of the startups that seem to be promising right now recently they tested the stage 2 of vikram launch rocket and they plan their maiden orbital launch this year sometime this year this is going to be yet another significant milestone and step towards privatization so when it comes to global stage right what are your thoughts on where india stands and their efforts what has it led to i think skyroot is a great starting point because it's one of the biggest private players in our country especially since they developed something like vikram something that comes as a close second is the new startup is another new startup agnikul cosmos and this company made global history recently and not just because their agnijet engine was a single piece engine or because it was semi cryogenic but because it was 3d printed like 3d printing is something that's available across our own universities and it teaches students that something as simple as you know like 3d printing can help develop complex even innovative solutions to something as large as rocketry and globally again aside from developments on the rocket side we have a gaganyatri or an isro astronaut that's set to join the international space station for the first time and this is a signed agreement between um axiom space i believe which is a united states based company we're sending captain shubhanshu shukla from the indian air force to space and this is going to be a collaboration with other international space agencies he's set to conduct approximately five experiments i think personally an astronaut fleet from our own country is always very exciting and it's a matter of pride especially for the next generation of engineers not just in the sense that it's a matter of pride but also it can help with our next generation of astronauts especially for future gaganyaan fleets and it also helps establish collaborations between india and other countries there are collaborations in the works in fact there's a collaboration mission between nasa and isro the nisar mission and nisar actually uses it's the first of its kind in the sense that it uses a dual frequency radar mapping system and they use it for ecological processes and natural phenomena it can also be used in disaster management and hopefully even agriculture given that we're in a agrarian economy since you mentioned collaboration right collaboration between isro and nasa paving way to some of the innovations and some of the initiatives that we have i think we are yet to see that kind of collaboration between our government and the private players in india uh, something similar to what nasa and spacex collaboration has but i think we are on the right track there's more to see one more thing you mentioned about agriculture and disaster management how these initiatives are taking shape making impact in those sectors there was one project that i recently worked on where i was trying to get my hands on high resolution imagery captured by satellites and earlier while we were dependent on satellite imagery provided by other countries i could see that in the past few years high resolution imagery from indian satellites are available for free and uh, this is pivotal for researchers and for the youth and for the students to actually take that step forward use uh, leverage these kind of technology and resources that are available and uh, make progress in this sector right Yajit, you also worked on some similar project right. uh, recently. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, for sure, the availability of these satellite images, right? Especially for the Indian subcontinent, that was a big game changer for us. And one of the projects which I did recently was how do I calculate the NTVI, that is normalized 
difference in the vegetation index which is very crucial to find say the amount of afforestation which has happened or the deforestation which has happened in the particular land area and given the context of indian subcontinent because as niharika rightly mentioned that we are an agrarian economy right and uh, that's the major chunk which our uh, population is involved into it's very vital for us and especially given the fact that we have a large population to feed and the exports as well if we count in uh, it's very vital that our production doesn't decline so that project was regarding that and of course the satellite imagery helped us a lot apart from that i would also like to mention that the bhuvan platform which isro has established recently it allows our own indian satellites to capture the entire indian subcontinent through the group of satellites uh, which are geo stationary as well as geo synchronous satellites and uh, which is helping actually it has already been implemented and it is helping indians to locate the wastelands and convert it into an agroforest which can again you know definitely help in mitigating the effects of climate change and of course increasing the production of crops and also i would like to mention one of the challenges which as a youth we quite see often especially if you are a resident of a metropolitan city let's say in delhi ncr or, or let's say some major industry cities right there is a lot of pollution right which we are facing right now these satellite images and these satellite data particularly can again help us in finding the root causes of these pollutants because they can detect uh, let's say few pollutants like nitrogen dioxide carbon monoxide and even you know we can trace back to the sources of these pollutants and gradually eradicate the entire cause of it and i think again you know satellite images have helped us a lot in that domain as well and i don't know if you guys remember this was a devastating incident which happened in india 2004 tsunami that was really a big tragedy which all of us faced as the country i mean that time the satellite technologies were not that advanced which led us to huge life losses and if i compare it to the current scenario i was recently reading the news that how insat 3dr by isro helped uh, predicting the trajectory of cyclone mcjohn and uh, government was able to timely you know take necessary measures and also evacuate the entire population from that region uh, helping millions of lives again so that's the transition which i see from 2004 to current scenario and makes me really proud that where we have really come so to this extent when we talk about space technology and satellite imagery and of course if i talk about aditya l1 which was again the recent satellite it is the talk of the hour because of certain solar storms and solar flares and solar studies which it is providing and i strongly feel that we should also know as a youth that why is it important to study about the solar flares and stuff so the solar storms and solar flares they can disrupt the communication and navigation systems basically and as they emit electromagnetic radiations and they are as satellites revolving in the orbit right they can disrupt their communications so the data which we are receiving can be distorted so it is very vital that we study these solar flares and solar phenomena so that we can calibrate the data accordingly the better we know the more accurate data we get and hence how that we can predict the scenarios in a more pronounced way so i do think all these applications of satellites and space technologies are really vital given the current world scenarios and the current world problems which we are facing and uh, i would also like to mention about the mangalyaan mission which was i guess the breakthrough mission when the entire nation came together to celebrate that because that was i guess the first time when i saw in my school days as well how we all started talking about the isro missions all together and given the fact that that was the proud moment because before that we all were feeling that okay maybe the budgets are not enough to you know send some cool space missions across like in the space but once we saw that it was a successful that to it almost half of the budget of what hollywood produce movies so that was a really very fascinating for us to discuss so i think that was a really motivating factor for me to know and read more about the space applications and of course the movies like rocketry and reading the biography of dr apj abdul kalam uh, again you know motivates you further to delve into this sector i think same you also got inspired by some indian scientist right i think yeah, yeah. so it's very inspiration you know when you talk about like how mangalyaan inspired a lot of people to pursue aerospace and plus there was a movie about it and it actually was a big movement for india as a whole and for the aerospace department i remember in my teenage days when i used to go to school and study about physics i was particularly intrigued by theoretical physics and especially about black holes and relativity and they fascinated me because like such a thing could even exist in space right so for me one of the biggest inspiration was subramanyam chandrashekhar 
So he was a theoretical physicist of India who made like significant contribution to the scientific knowledge about the structure of stars, stellar evolution, even black holes. And the fun fact, he was awarded a scholarship to study at University of Cambridge. He even, in fact, won a Nobel Prize for his work with Dr. William A. Fowler. And he was also a recipient of Padma Vibhushan and Royal Medal. So his work primarily uh, structured around this, but one of the major work for which he was awarded a scholarship to study at University of Cambridge was on white dwarfs. So imagine sun, right? And imagine what would happen if the sun's mass goes out. So like what's burning the sun, the fuel of the sun goes out. Now you have this entity which radiates out, emits out mass. So he theorized the major work done on white dwarfs, which was very exciting for me when I read about it. In fact, for his work on white dwarfs, there's a concept named Chandrasekhar limit, which basically talks about how much the mass of white dwarfs could not exist 1.44 times the that of the sun. And so he's a true gem for me. Like I mean, there are other physicists like Richard Feynman and Albert Einstein, but he really inspired me a lot. And I think Niharika was also telling me the other day about her journey through aerospace engineering that she's currently pursuing. Since we're talking about some role models that got me into the field of aerospace engineering, personally, there is Ritu Karidalji, the rocket woman of India, who has made significant contributions to the field of aerospace, whether it's through Mangalyan or Chandrayaan-3. And not only her, there's also Dr. Kalpana Chawala. I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, and it was solely because of Dr. Kalpana Chawla. She has inspired so many little girls across the country, and she is remembered with such pride, even to an extent that there are initiatives that are named after her. Skyroot, which was something that we discussed earlier, has a fellowship system for girls. It's the first space tech fellowship exclusively for women in our country. It's really welcoming to hear your inspirations, especially the Indian figures who hold a really dear place in your hearts and inspire you. I'm sure a lot of the nation's youth have inspirational figures similar to yours. Although I don't have a role model in particular, I was really fascinated by UAV systems for the longest time. Worked on UAV systems, uh, I think I started in 8th grade, 8th or ninth grade in my high school. And then Professor Omkar was a really inspirational figure. Uh, because during my undergrad, he really gave me the opportunity to take this project further to in this UAV space and um, really facilitated my endeavors in that domain. And with that, I would like to just mention something about how India reached space. I think what is fascinating is in the early days when India could barely walk and they decided to go on this Chandrayaan mission, the world really didn't expect us to accomplish such a kind of a mission we proved them wrong then and now how far we've come along and the way i see it i can only wait to see more what is in store for us i think in conclusion this conversation really helps us establish how developed india is in the space sector and how far we've come from where we began there was a point in time where Globally, it was believed that India would not find its footing in the space sector, especially post-independence. But I think we've really established ourselves, whether it's with the help of others or within our country through privatization. With that, we would like to conclude this discussion. We have Samai Patel, Niharika Naveen, Yajat Goswami, and myself, Neeraj Ramprasad, from Department of Aerospace Engineering, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. We are researchers uh, working under the guidance of Dr. S. N. Omkar. Thank you for tuning in. Sara Jahan Sayaja. हिंदुस्तान हमारा वेल वी हर्ड इट स्ट्रेट फ्रॉम द यंग स्कॉलर्स वर्किंग एट वन ऑफ इंडियाज प्रीमियम रिसर्च फैसिलिटीज हाउ द स्पेस टेक्नोलॉजी इन द कंट्री हैज कम दिस फार टचिंग वन माइल स्टोन आफ्टर अन अदर वी ऑलरेडी हैव आवर ओन रोवर नेविगेशन सिस्टम and 3d printed rocket engine what more is to come who can say but we can imagine the vast mystery of the space is waiting to be unraveled by the human kind and indians are most definitely going to be among the vanguards of this exploration what a great time to be young in this country to all the children adolescents youth dreaming to be astronauts cosmonauts rocket scientists and engineers i say dream away to your heart's content 
when you open your eyes. Every opportunity, every ounce of support, funding, technique, the best teachers, mentors will be within your reach in your very own country. Truly. Sare jaha se achha. We sign off now with best wishes and greetings to our countrymen for the upcoming first National Space Day. This program was brought to you by Akashwani Bengaluru.